congratulations, Pfizer. I think that was a fantastic presentation. You took most of uh, what I was going to talk about um, in already, because this is digital at its finest. And uh, I was saying earlier, I tested it myself. Um, if you've ever gone through London immigration with those iris scan ones, uh, more often than not, you're going down like this because there's three levels of iris, and uh, often things are this tall. So for whatever reason, um, this is a much, much better system. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, digital transformation and what it means to be a truly digital company and also um, how important it is to be a digital leader, not a digital follower. And um, as you rightfully said, um, ASEAN is one of those areas where digital is at the forefront. Um, we have more cell phones, uh, which are already smartphones, than most other parts of the world. Um, we are um, uh, leading the curve in uh, Instagram. I think uh, um, uh, Thailand has in Bangkok two of the top most Instagram places. It's the Bangkok airport and it's Paragon. Um, uh, a shopping mall, um, uh, Twitter and uh, um, uh, Facebook is uh, number two in Indonesia, so we're everywhere. Uh, so digital is definitely driving consumer, digital is driving everything. Digital is bringing together a lot of technologies that are out there. So mobility, a couple of years ago, nobody would have thought about talking about a smartphone that gets lost in the washroom. Um, today it's the reality of this plenary. Um, digital platforms, uh, 14 of the 30 most important... My mic a little bit up. Ah, here we go. This sounds better, okay. Um, so uh, digital platforms, 14 of the top 30 most valued companies are actually co um, considering themselves to, uh, to be running digital platforms. I'll get to that in a bit later. Um, artificial intelligence, big data and analytics, everybody's talking about it. Robotics, another one of those uh, technologies that's coming out and it's really changing our life. And uh, I think we just have to live with the fact that in the near future, robotics will actually be running us and not um, uh, supporting us only. And social media, one of the hot topics, one of the big um, changes of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the market. So it's really defining who we are. It's impacting all aspects of our life. Um, it changes the way that we shop. Um, one of the downsides of moving to Singapore is actually that I no longer get to use um, Amazon Prime um, and get the same day delivery or next day delivery. Um, so that's definitely changed my way of shopping back to a more traditional one. Entertainment, um, I was just reading about Netflix new numbers. More than 60 million subscribers. Um, um, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, just said, traditional television is dead or almost dead. I agree. Um, education, exercise, uh, travel. Uh, I was in Europe last week, and uh, I used uh, normal taxis for a change. And uh, it was very strange at the end of the taxi ride for me to actually open up my wallet and take out a credit card or some cash. I've, bitten, I've gotten so used to just uh, getting out of the cab these days. It's uh, uh, very, very different. Payments is another one. Um, so up to a year ago, um, Starbucks in the US was about 85% of mobile payments. Um, that's obviously dramatically changing with the new um, uh, payment systems, new payment providers, and Apple Pay coming out. But all of that is impacting the way that we do our things. Often we don't notice it anymore until we actually do something like my taxi ride last week in Europe. Um, Whole industries are being disrupted. And uh, this is actually an interesting slide. Um, so uh, it's no longer just the incumbents or the attackers that you see here. All of a sudden, the attackers are getting attacked again by the incumbents because digital is not just something for the small companies, uh, but we would actually say digital, the next big thing in digital is big. Um, so it's the big companies striking back or taking advantage of these technologies, taking advantage of the ecosystems that we can be part of to really drive it. Um, so be it banking, and it's obviously a very easy one to disrupt and very easy to do cherry picking around payments. Um, about 30%, 35% of banking revenue is at risk, the way that we know it. Retail, I see some very good um, online retail concepts coming back from the incumbents. So, um, but what we do have to know is the way that it's changing. Um, so if you have interested consumers, um, and I would say Pinterest users that actually post something about you are very interested, they're obviously buying a lot more. How can you use that? How can you leverage that? Energy, fantastic one. Communications, uh, what's up? I mean, how many minutes of uh, uh, telephone are we still doing every day? It's uh, only to call my taxi and to say, where are you? Or to um, uh, have an emergent situation. Everything else is what's up these days. It's uh, uh, on Skype or iMessage. Um, uh, it's, it's no longer that telephone one. And obviously hospitality. Companies like Airbnb um, having nothing but access, but being valued more than some of the companies there on the left side. So Airbnb, more value with zero hotel rooms than higher hotels. Um, that has, I think, about 11,000 hotel rooms. ASEAN, no different than that. And I understand that this morning you already had a fantastic overview of um, how much uh, ASEAN has responded to this. Um, so everybody's using online channels to learn more about products and services. Depending on what category, that goes up to 100%. Um, online channels offer more convenience and choice, of course. Um, reading online, of course. Um, posting about it, not being shy. If you look at all the Pinterest, all the Facebook posts, uh, all of the blogging that's going on, fantastic. 
So it's really disrupted the way that we're doing things, and especially the ASEAN uh, consumers are taking advantage of it. And obviously, what I said earlier, um, some of these companies that are part of the digital revolution are getting shockingly uh, high amounts of valuation. So if I look at Uber, zero cars in its portfolio, valued more than Delta Airlines, um, that's amazing. So access being more relevant actually than the asset itself, and the question is, how can you take advantage of that? And as a uh, industry player, all of you have fantastic access to your clients, and you can get better at it and take advantage of it. It's not just the Ubers of this world that should be controlling the playing field. So the question is, with all that digital transformation, is your organization ready to respond? And uh, our answer would be, there's about five areas that are really going to make a difference for you in the near future. So if you can shift that from me, just us looking into our own company, to a V economy, taking advantage of some of the de uh, techn uh, technology that's out there, then you're on a very good way. One of it is the internet of me, the outcome economy, the platform revolution, intelligent enterprise, and workforce reimagined. So today's world, it's no longer just enough to run your own company, but you have to see how can I better engage with my customers? How can I better engage across my company? How can I open my company up to other players? How can I open up to the Internet of Things? Um, it's no longer really driving uh, just a particular product. A lot of this has to do with outcomes. Um, so am I selling electricity or am I selling a cool room or lighting? Um, uh, so it's really more of an outcome economy that's driving that. Am I selling insurance in the future when there's uh, no more cars that are being driven by drivers? So what am I insuring? The risk of me as an individual driving a car? Am I insuring the value of my car? Am I insuring um, the fact that my car keeps running? So those are all the questions that we have to ask ourselves and how we can partner and how we can bring it together. So give some examples. The Internet of Me, our world personalized. What is changing that? In today's world, we would all say the customer has actually become a, a center of the attention again. So it's really about delivering highly, uh, highly personalized experiences. So 89% of consumers also in ASEAN would say, as soon as I have a bad experience, um, I'm, I'm open to switching to somewhere else. It's easier than ever to switch. Um, it's beyond mobility. So it's not just saying I can reach you anywhere, I can reach you on any device, I'm reaching you everywhere all the time. Um, there's rising consumer demand for all of these tools out there. Um, so wearables growing at a double rate, um, at doubling every year basically. Um, mobile phones, everybody's got that cell phone, everybody's got the smartphone these days. 30 years ago, you needed all of the stuff there on the right side um, to have the same experience that the small device gives you today. Um, how can we take use of that? Um, so all of that music, all of the video, all of the communication, it's all in here. Um, all of that means that you also can deliver contextual experiences. So it's not enough to just say, okay, I've got a consumer that's coming, um, if I can recognize somebody by face, if I can recognize somebody just by the cell phone that he's using, if I can recognize somebody just uh, looking at it, and uh, I was actually happy, Faisal, that um, your uh, device doesn't say, okay, it's a Caucasian and he looks like he's 50 years old or whatever, because um, a lot of these video analytics is focused just on, uh, on age and, uh, and gender, right? Um, so I'm happy about uh, 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 you cutting that out. Um, but it's really about delivering that contextual experience and personalizing everywhere. So recognizing somebody, relating to it, and really making recommendations that are, that are very positive. A great way to interact better with your consumers, with the end user. Number two, outcome economy. Um, so it's really about hardware producing hard results. Uh, what has changed in the past? Um, we are no longer reliant on just having contracts that say, okay, if you do this, you get that, and then um, having auditing companies really understand and trying to find out um, what happened and is the result the one that it should be. Um, today's world, the hardware, and I don't even know if the word hardware is really a good one anymore, um, will help you um, to completely change your business models. Um, so uh, everybody has heard about the beacons, Bluetooth, uh, low energy, about uh, devices that can measure almost anything. Um, it is the reality today. Um, so hardware is approachable. Everybody can go out there and crowdsource um, their own devices. So you've got people like Wyclef John, I don't know if anybody knows him in the room here, he's a musician um, who says, I'm bringing out my own smartphone and my own um, smartwatch. Um, why would he do that if Apple and all of the other companies are doing such a great job of it already? He can do a niche market, he can design a product, and it's cheap to build. You just uh, tap into an ecosystem of partners, um, go into China, and a couple of days later, you've got your own uh, smartwatch. An 18-year-old from California is doing the same. He's done it two years ago, uh, made a couple of million, now he's saying, I'm creating my own smartwatch. Um, I would have thought a few years ago, stupid idea, but it is approachable today. m to m economics. Um, so all of these devices are getting smaller and cheaper. Um, the Bluetooth ones are now stickers. It's almost like a plaster. These things run forever. Um, uh, these things can measure everything, sensor efficiency. Um, so you can put a little Bluetooth somewhere. It's going to run for five years. It's as small as a sticker. Think about uh, duty-free shopping. 
put a blue, blue sticker on there, you know exactly where that product is, you know exactly when that product is taken out of the country. No longer necessary for me to open up my suitcase at the airport and say, I bought this, I want my tax refund. Um, it can all be measured automatically. So sensor efficiency driving that. At the same time, in today's world, we're creating great, great M2M standards. So it's uh, no longer who comes first uh, captures it all, but it's really about creating the standard and saying, okay, how can all of these things interconnect? How can all of these devices um, uh, be on their own? So if you look at the company Nest uh, saying, it's more about the system that we're creating. It's more about having every other um, um, uh, device that can talk to my uh, heating machine, to my light, uh, to my door, to my security system. So the company that Google bought uh, is no longer about creating the better looking devices, which I think they have done in the past, but it's about opening up that ecosystem saying, we can create up to 800 different M2M standards that can connect to our system, so we are ubiquitous. And the last one, obviously, ubiquitous bandwidth. We're already in a stage where there's more mobile um, um, uh, bandwidth, there's more mobile um, uh, data um, than fixed line data. Bandwidth is everywhere. We can collect the data everywhere. Even in a time when I may not have a signal, if I'm out in Indonesia, I want to do precision agriculture, I can fly a drone above it, I can collect the data from whatever device, it doesn't have to be on all the time, I can go back and make it happen. So with this, I can really talk about outcomes, I can measure outcomes very precisely, I can measure outcomes all the time, and I can also be proactive about um, optimizing them. Third one, the plat platform revolution. So it's all about defining ecosystems and redefining the way that industries work. So it's not about being locked up in your own place, it's really opening up. Uh, a lot of companies have quoted, and I still think it's a very good example, Apple as being someone who has opened up the ecosystem. Actually, other people are um, providing the value for Apple because they are creating the better um, apps, they're creating the better camera systems on there, they're creating everything that we as a consumer love. Um, whereas a company like BlackBerry, famous for security, famous for being an encapsulated system, um, is not doing that great anymore. Um, uh, so it's all about opening up, it's all about having others design and create for you. Um, so I said earlier, we have about um, a 30, uh, f about 14 of the top 30 companies from a is it not working so well? Okay. Um, so we have about, is it on now? Yes. So we have about 30 of the, uh, sorry, 14 of the top 30 valued companies are uh, calling themselves digital platforms. Um, we have about another 100 companies coming in in the next um, uh, one or two years who are creating digital platforms um, who would not have called themselves technology companies in the past. So what is it? A technology, or sorry, a digital platform is actually just a platform that allows you, or a company that allows others to tap into it. Um, it's about um, 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 allowing others to be part of your ecosystem, to create for you, to build things for you. Um, possible because of digital disruption, because of cloud, because of mobility, because of all of those um, uh, areas, software obviously. Possible because of cloud economics. It's cheaper than ever to build up a digital platform. You've got Microsoft, you've got uh, Amazon, you've got others hosting it for you. So it's just a, a question of getting people onto that platform. So it's become everybody's playing field. You don't have to create your own technology anymore. You just have to buy some of that technology. And uh, obviously the power of APIs, so all of the interfaces is what's driving it. Um, so with the API, um, everybody can connect into you and you are able to collaborate, you're able to build something jointly. Intelligent enterprise, so number four. Huge data, smarter systems, better business. I think this is one that everybody's been talking about. Um, what does it mean exactly? Um, so it's really enabling the enterprise to really leverage all of the data that's out there. Uh, everybody's been hearing about the enormous uh, uh, rise of data volumes. I think uh, when they started talking about petabytes a few years ago, I kind of quit, um, so I don't even know how much a petabyte is, and now we're talking about 40 zettabytes of data getting created all the time and everything doubling every two years or every one year, every half year. It doesn't really matter. I think what's really interesting is that more and more companies are saying, the data that we have is really valuable. Um, so about a year ago, we did research and we asked companies, um, how much of the data that you can collect will you actually work with? And they said, uh, maybe up to 10% was the average answer. And in today's world, the companies are saying, we're collecting everything and it's going to be about 35% of that data that's in there we can actually put to good use. We can crunch, we can do something with, and it's fantastic. Obviously, the decreasing cost of storage is, is amazing. Um, so a couple of years ago, actually not a couple, but in 1980, one gigabyte of data um, had a value or had a cost of storage of 400,000 US dollars. Um, in today's world, it's 0 0.05 dollars, so five cents uh, per gigabyte and that halves every 14 uh, months. Um, so it's uh, basically free to store data these days. And uh, I remember many years ago when we did projects, we had to ask somebody to go 
and get the data from another city where it was on some uh, fancy device uh, to bring it back in just to do some uh, checkpoint analysis. Um, so really amazing. Virtually unlimited computing power. Um, so Amazon and all the other clouds um, allowing you to really have the computing power when you need it, when you want it, um, uh, at a very low pace. Um, and, uh, and obviously the advances in data science allowing you to do more sophisticated um, things, just like Faisal is doing out there um, with all of the artificial intelligence, all of the cognit cognitive computing, machine learning. Everybody's talking about Watson and, uh, uh, and, and what's the future of that. So uh, amazing what you can do if you leverage all of that. And the final one, the workforce reimagined. Um, so really collaboration at the intersection of humans and machines. Um, we sometimes also talk about the omni-colleague. Um, so it's not just you anymore on your own having to do things, um, but you actually have an electronic or um, uh, some kind of a, a digital assistant with you all the time. And uh, it's your smartphone or it might be a little robot doing the heavy lifting for you. It's really the omni-colleague. It's the pair of glasses that allow, allow you to see further, that allow you to um, get the data that you need, that allow you to um, fix a car, uh, um, so BMW is doing this, so they have a lot of very good technicians in their headquarter in Munich. When somebody in the US needs to fix a car, they actually do like an iPad uh, sort of um, collaboration. Um, they have somebody looking over your shoulder while you're trying to fix the car uh, in Munich, telling you, do this screw, do that screw. It's a little bit like in the James Bond movies, when uh, which cable to cut, and uh, now uh, you've got someone who's uh, uh, telling you exactly which one to do. So what is happening there? Um, and why is it becoming less and less scary? Um, and uh, the discussion around, is the robot going to be my friend or not? It's really maturing technology. So it's getting faster and it's getting uh, 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 more efficient um, what robots can do. Um, the, one of the most fascinating things I've recently seen is uh, robots that can self-assemble. Um, so when you have uh, earthquake situations or a collapsed house, little robots that will, um, the size of the microphone here, go in there and then they will start to self-assemble inside to create a structure um, to and, and lift things out. So it's, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, it sounds a bit scary. We were talking about Transformers out there, uh, not Transformers, about uh, Terminator. It's a little bit like that, but uh, in this case, it's for good use. Um, so really maturing technology, human-like interactions. Um, uh, so the robot is becoming more of a friend. Um, uh, for instance, um, uh, one of the uh, telcos in Europe, KPN, has a call center that's um, highly automated, 95% of all of the traffic that comes into that call center is fully automated. It's actually an assistant talking to you. You don't notice the difference because the voice quality is so good. Only in 5% of the cases does it need to get rerouted to another, um, uh, to a real agent. Um, so the human-like interaction, both from a voice perspective, but also from a personal perspective, is fantastic. In Japan, uh, we're looking at very much at um, creating a companion for the elderly population. Um, so Japan has a situation where the next couple of years you have a lot of elderly men who would either have to go into a nursing home or try to move in with their families. Um, it's a question of dignity, if you want to do that or not. Um, they don't like the concept so much. So they're getting a robot at their side, which will help them walk to the store to do the normal shopping, which will help them to do average chores um, um, and just be a companion to do most of these things. So you give the dignity back to the individual, let them live a very free life um, using robotics. It's obviously a big question now for insurance companies. Do we now need to offer robot insurance? Uh, do we need to offer insurance um, for the robot breaking something? Um, uh, is it like a child? Is it something that you can control? Um, so a good, good question. Uh, workforce reimagined, fast ROI. What do we mean when we talk about that? It's um, uh, about 30% uh, reduction in cost on average that we are seeing from robots in the next two to three years in factories. That means the investment that you're making into these kind of um, systems and these kind of technologies are repaying themselves much, much faster. Um, obviously adding to improved efficiency. Uh, a lot of people were laughing about Google Glass not being as effective and being taken off the market, but there's a lot of other glass solutions out there, and Google will strike back with a better version. It was all about creating the excitement. Um, we would say about 30 per 40% improved efficiency in many cases when you have Google Glass on and you are actually able to uh, sneak it out of your corner of your eye. What am I doing? What am I seeing? What's the information that I need? Uh, really enabling you to work with both your hands at the same time that Google Glass or any other glass is on. And obviously, one of the very, very important cases is the worker safety. So if we look at um, uh, mining, uh, a lot of the things that are easy to get, as you know, have already been taken uh, from the surface of the planet. Um, so we have to go deeper and deeper and into more dangerous areas. Robots will be a very good friend to make that happen. Same with space, um, same in almost any other situation. So I think uh, EHS, uh, so all the health and safety uh, requirements, um, very much going to be supported by robots. And uh, just to finish, three examples, I think, of companies that are bringing it all together. Um, and uh, um, just one more time on you, Faisal, I could have taken yours, because um, I think that's a, 
a great way to bring it together. So uh, Disney uh, really creating that integrated park experience with an all-in-one band. Has anybody seen it in action already? Nobody yet. Um, we'll do have it soon also here for the zoos. Um, so um, we're going to try and bring it over. Um, so Disney is doing very well, obviously, at creating uh, lifestyle experiences, at creating emotion, at creating um, a, 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 a very good interaction on television, online, everywhere, and uh, creating that Disney experience. Uh, when you go to a Disney park these days, you can go online, you can do all of your booking, um, you can tell people who's coming with you, are you going as a couple, are you going with a family, who's the individuals, what are they involved in, what would you like to see, what would you like to do. Um, in today's world, um, Disney is no longer just saying, okay, that's interesting to know, um, so that we can do better planning for our park capacity, but actually what they're doing is uh, that collecting all of that data, they're sending you now some nice arm wrists to your home and saying, okay, um, uh, put these on and you get automated entrance. We always know who you are. We always know uh, if we should address you with your name. Uh, it can be a little bit creepy if uh, the Frozen characters or Mickey Mouse comes to your son and says, hello Kai, how are you doing? Um, or it can be very nice, but you can choose in today's world, right? Um, uh, in, in the past it was always just, oh, hello kid. Um, and now it can be very personalized. Um, so um, providing fast pass access and also conne uh, connecting to Disney's photo pass. So when you have uh, what I always think is very annoying, um, the, perf uh, the people taking the photos of you while you're going down a waterfall or you're um, taking a sky train somewhere, um, uh, but you do want that photo in the end, um, you don't have to buy it exactly at the checkout um, uh, when you're going off the train. You can get it anytime now because it's obviously connecting directly also to your Disney photo pass. So I think really creating a seamless experience, contextual, personalized, uh, using technology in a very easy way, um, uh, and using a very nicely done um, wristband with that. So it's interesting, you can check it out on YouTube. It's a very nice video also about that. Another one, um, so face scanning, um, digital signage. Um, what Tesco is starting to do in the UK, so they're in about 450 petrol stations. Um, these petrol stations get about 5 million people um, uh, to the checkout counter every week. Um, what they are trying to do now, or what they're doing already, is very simple video analytics. All they're doing is understanding who is coming at what time of day. Um, so what's the age profile and what's the gender. All they want to do uh, with this information is say, instead of always having the same uh, stupid advertisements, the same generic advertisements behind my back, I will start to personalize a little bit to age group, to gender, um, not to the individual yet, so not recognizing immediately uh, male, X number of years old, but just um, uh, doing it for the day, time of day for uh, what's happening, a little bit like um, think of McDonald's that has the coffee shop in the morning, then has the lunch menu and the dinner menu, um, but uh, a little bit more sophisticated than that. And uh, obviously it's just the start of it because in the, in the near future with all the loyalty data and, um, and using more advanced uh, facial recognition uh, as we have just seen, um, that will go a lot deeper. And the one um, last example, and I don't know if it's a good one to end off uh, or not with the smart diapers is, um, uh, is also quite interesting. So really taking it into the very, very normal use cases, um, and this is interesting both for uh, those of you who have very small children and are always worried about their health, or those of you who have parents that are in nursing homes, or all of us uh, as we get older, means we have to run to the doctor less often. Um, so if we can uh, integrate technology into something as simple as a diaper, and this is, uh, this is, I mean, these are articles that cost 30, 40 cents per use, right? So it's not uh, a couple of dollars of technology going in here, but very simple ones, um, measuring all of uh, what's going on, measuring if you have any disease, measuring if you are uh, in, in a healthy state, um, giving feedback to whoever um, you have uh, authorized this to, um, a fantastic technology that's out there. So just three examples of um, how a lot of companies are already using this and how it's uh, becoming part of our daily life. And in a few years' time, when we look at these examples, Nobody's going to say wow because everybody's saying, yeah, we've been using this for the last five years. So a future with no regrets. Um, so what does it mean? It really means um, uh, understanding who you can partner with if you think that you have missing capabilities or if you don't think that uh, building them organically is going to happen fast enough. I think in today's world, everybody's talking about agile, everybody's talking about uh, speed to market. It's very true, um, but you don't have to do everything on your own anymore. You can collaborate, you can uh, partner, you can make things happen. The second one, I think, is the more tricky one. Um, so um, um, I'm early 40s, uh, standing up on stage talking about digital seems a bit odd um, because I'm already way too old um, to talk about social media. That's why I skipped that one. I'm way too old to talk about many of these other things. Um, who's the 25-year-old? Who's that 28-year-old? Who's below 30 in your organization that can actually drive digital? Um, and are we willing enough, um, and this is, I think, also particularly interesting in this part of the world, are we willing enough to let the young people um, take more control, to take more accountability of driving the future of our business. Um, 
then also do you understand really how your customers are rating their experience? Um, what are the expectations? Um, how can you use some of that data that they're giving you? Just because we are collecting more data doesn't mean that uh, we don't have to use it or that, uh, that, the, uh, that we can't use it in a way that the uh, um, consumer wants it. There's also the expectation. Just like I said, I want everything to be as easy as Amazon. I want my payment to be uh, integrated always just like Uber is doing it. Um, what are really the expectations? Do you know them and do you really cater to those needs? Um, the digital team. Um, a couple of years ago, when we were talking about digital teams, um, we had uh, an e-commerce, we had an e-commerce department, and then we had a traditional marketing and uh, sales department. In today's world, in many cases, the marketing department has been taken over by that woman or the guy that ran the e-commerce one, even though they were trying to keep them down for so, so many years. Um, so what's really changed is uh, um, having the right digital team, allowing them to be unconstrained. Um, even companies like Walmart are pretty good at it these days, um, uh, taking back um, some of that um, uh, digital into their, into their company. Um, but it's only because they have created that right type of environment for them. And I think the last one is, do we really understand um, who is going to hurt our business or who's going to drive our business in the future? Um, do we know who is our competition? Do we know who's going to be our competition in one, two or three years' time? Do we know who's going to have the, uh, the share of our wallet? Um, yeah, so those are the things I think all of us need to be thinking about constantly and engaging on. So the question is really, digital follower or digital leader, um, which path will your business take? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Michelis, for that enlightening session on digital transformation.